right. Hello, everyone, and welcome. How are you? Let's try again. Yeah. How are you this morning? <laughs> A very warm welcome to the Berkman Klein Center, to Harvard Law School on this sunny but windy and slightly chilly day. Um, we're really delighted to have you here. Uh, my name is Urs Gasser. I serve as the executive director of the Berkman Klein Center. I'm also on uh, Harvard Law School faculty, my colleague that I will introduce just in a bit. Uh, and of course, I'm <coughs> very, very um, pleased to moderate this special conversation about um, the ethics of digital transformation. And I'm, of course, even more uh, pleased and actually honored uh, to welcome the federal president of Germany, Frank-Walter Steinmeier. Hello. Herzlich willkommen. It's schön, Sie hier zu haben. Thank you, sir. We are joined by a wonderful group of colleagues and experts. And uh, I will, if you are not mad with me, I will just briefly introduce you. And we will get to know each other a bit better as we go along and talk about your work. Uh, and of course, um, as we engage in an opening conversation. So this should be interactive as much as we can. Eva Weber Gurska is a um, ethicist, a philosopher, uh, currently at the Ruhr University in Bochum. It's doing amazing work, uh, and uh, I'm already looking forward to, to learning from you today. Uh, quite often, these debates about ethics happen without having philosophers uh, around us, so I'm grateful uh, <laughs> that you're here. Matthew Liao is at NYU as a professor of bioethics. Uh, he also runs a center on the same topic, and I will, I'm particularly curious to hear also uh, some of the lessons learned from past cycles of technological innovation as we now talk about digital things and AI and IoT and, and the like. Jeanette Hoffman, uh, welcome back. Uh, great to have you here. Uh, Jeanette is a professor of internet uh, policy at the Free University um, in Berlin. She's also the director of the um, Alexander von Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society uh, in Berlin. We introduced the president already, and he doesn't need an introduction. <laughs> yeah. So um, next we have Dean Melissa Nobles, who's the dean of the School of Humanities, Arts, and Social Sciences at MIT. Uh, really great to have you here. Um, as we will hear more about, uh, MIT is building a new school of computing. It's Correct. the Schwarzman College. Right. Uh, lots of interesting things happening there at the intersection of engineering and ethics. Uh, so looking forward to, to your thoughts and this conversation. Wolfgang Schulz, professor for media and public law at the University of Hamburg. He's also the director, and now I have to read that because I still cannot remember it, the director of the Leibniz Institute for Media Research, uh, which is known to me as the Hans Bredow Institute, but I learned this is important to emphasize the Leibniz <laughs> part. Crystal Young, uh, really great faculty colleague here, professor of law, at Harvard Law School, um, does wonderful work, important work um, on uh, criminal justice and the use of algorithms and data in that area. We'll talk more about that. So as you can see, a fa fantastic lineup. And of course, uh, I'm so grateful uh, to you, Mr. President, that you joined this group as a participant. And I get a sense already that you're ready to jump in and will take over the moderation function in due course, which is totally fine and will make my job easier. Um, so one uh, or two logistical notes. First, we, we will end at roughly 11.30. Uh, that's the plan. Some segments of the conversation may be in German. Uh, you should have uh, translation. Um, if it's okay with you, I will continue to moderate in English. And I think the reason is straightforward, because my Swiss accent is so strong when I speak German <laughs> that it's easier for the Germans uh, when I talk English. So, uh, just to make that clear. <laughs> so with that, um, Herr Bundespräsident, uh, here, here is the question for you to start us off. We met uh, the last time in 2012 uh, in Berlin and um, had a conversation about what does it mean to make good policies for the internet age. 
And I Googled this morning, actually, and tried to remember what happened in 2012, right? It seems like in internet times, it's more like 70 years ago than seven yeah. years ago. And when I Googled, um, things that happened there in the technology space was the Google Glass project uh, was kicked off. The iPad mini was introduced. Facebook went public. And a bill was signed in California that self-driving cars are now allowed and were regulated. So I'm wondering, that seems to be a very different stage in our digital transformation process. If you look back only a few years and now fast forward 2019, where have we arrived? What are you thinking about? What are your concerns? What are your hopes? Um, and how does that connect with the topic of today, yeah. Mr. President? Well, thank you very much indeed for these kind words of welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, dear students, I think it is fantastic. You know, you've been given the alternative to enjoy a sunshiny day, though somewhat windy late autumn, but you've nevertheless decided in favor of the alternative coming here into an enclosed room to listen to us. Thank you very much for that. And thank you also for reminding me of the year 2012, which I remember well for quite different different reasons, and I'll get back to that in a second, you know, my visit to Boston in 1220. But allow me to begin by saying that I haven't been here for the very first time, and I'm always happy to be back in this academic scientific center, a center not only with regard to the United States of America, but also in a much broader sense, because it is a center that is exemplary in bringing together researchers and academics from all parts of the world, from all countries of the world, to make them work on subjects of common concern. And when I remember that visit in 2012, but earlier visits too and later visits, you know, no matter whether we talked about foreign policy issues or other issues, either here in the hall or in other places in Harvard, whether we talked about questions to do with climate policy, uh, about the state of affairs of transatlantic relations, rest assured, every time that I came here, I returned home uh, having benefited to a large extent from the discussions I had at Harvard. There was one exception, just, and that brings me back to 12, 2012, really. Just once did I risk myself, my whole existence here in Harvard, because I allowed myself to be talked into throwing the first pit in a baseball mat. And I was extremely naive. Never, ever had I before attended a baseball match, held a baseball in my hands, nor been in a baseball stadium. And my then colleague, uh, Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice, we all remember her, was aghast when she heard at what I was about to do. And the only comment she gave to me was, don't do it. But, you know, that is typical of us Germans. I had accepted and I didn't want to go back on my promise. So, once we entered the stadium on the afternoon of that day, you know, I got an inkling of why my colleague Kundalisa Rice was so aghast because the stadium was filled to the very last seat, 40 or 50,000 people in the audience, and I had a certain feeling that they hadn't come just because of me, but they'd come because they wanted to, match, uh, to watch the match. A match that was the match, really. Here in the United States, the Red Sox were playing the New York Yankees. And I realized all of a sudden that this is not just any match, it's about religious issues, really. Still, it worked out somehow. I survived it. And having survived that experience, I was happy to come back every time I wasn't shy of returning to Boston to Harvard. But today it's a different topic, really, that brings me here, uh, different from the topics we focused on in the past uh, years. We are no longer on the threshold of the digitization of digitization of the digital age, but we have already entered that age. 
Uh, I've, I've come here because the topic we will be talking about um, directly refers back to topics I'm focusing on in my presidency, the future of liberal democracy, that is. How does the internet, how do Facebook, Twitter, algorithms, anonymity in the internet, how do all these things change the democratic culture of debate, uh, which is of such great importance to us in Germany, just as it, uh, much as you do in the United States of America. Despite the daily waves of outrage that you have to live with, how can we make sure that we keep a general overview? How can we distinguish what is important from what is unimportant? unimportant? And does this culture of thinking in um, simple opposites, yes or no, black or white, harsh approaches, whether that takes away from us our ability to see the nuances uh, between black and white. Are we capable of doing that? Do we continue to be capable of entering into compromise, which I believe to be vital for any democracy? Um, if we no, no longer have the time to differentiate or to see things in nuances, in carefully weighing the pros and cons, because it's no longer popular. Uh, we talked about this yesterday in Boston with American and German academics in great depth. Today, though, um, we are again talking about digital transformation, how that has changed our lives and daily experiences. But as uh, Mr. Gasser kindly indicated, we will be focusing on a different priority. It's n we're not really focusing on the question whether we need digital technologies. They're there anyway. No one is denying the fact that they open up enormous opportunities for all of us when it comes to fighting poverty, for example, when it comes to tackling the impact of climate change when it comes to combating diseases and their effects. Uh, undoubtedly, Germany is a country that has no resources over its own. Out of the humanities, we want to, and humane resources, we uh, want to be a country that has technology to offer, and we want to uh, participate in the developments they entail, and that as a kind of introductory rem remark on my part. As regards the topic we intend to talk about today, the ethic, uh, the ethic, a code of ethics for the digital transformation, um, I would like to just briefly focus on um, why this topic is so important to me. I, I actually have come from two visits, and I refer back to those visits. Um, I visited Stanford last year, uh, focused again on the future of digitization. When we traveled there a few days before we left, we read in the papers that Elon Musk had brought up a company that um, was engaging in the research in brain implants and that was doing very well in that regard, that this might help tackle diseases like Parkinson and Alzheimer's. I learned a lot about the imagination of researchers during my encounters there, how one can uh, influence uh, brain activities with the help of implants and algorithms. This has undeniable and obvious consequences. But at the end of the discussion, the discussion it was an I, but it was someone who is very well known in the United States, George Schultz, that is the former Secretary of State under Ronald Reagan, who also is uh, or was at the time a member of the board of Stanford University. He said at the end of the discussion, guys, really, mates, I'm, I'm fascinated by the scenario you have been painting, drawing of the future, but let's not forget we are living in a democracy, and democracy relies on independent, self-determined, confident human beings if it is to survive. So, and he addressed himself to the researchers and the academics. So when developing these te te technologies, don't forget to think of the consequences of your uh, inventions and how that fits into democracy and its principles. And my second trip, and I'm going to be brief about this with my visit to China. Um, again, we also focused on this topic. And then we also talked about social scoring, the opportunities, the perspectives that 
result for the members of a society. The debates we had were not easy because at the beginning, the Chinese didn't understand why we were asking these questions at all and why we would find some of these things complicated that come up in the context of social scoring. Because they said we have 80, 90 percent of support, popular support for these topics. Why are you against it? You know, we who we live under different political circumstances are scared and shocked by the idea of having to submit to total surveillance of all our aspects of our lives. That no matter what we do, this might be linked up to a system that assesses our performance in a negative or a positive way, and that this, of course, has an effect on the way we developed as human beings, that hopes, wishes, and dreams are becoming externalized, that they are stored on a software I no longer have any influence over. Um, for our concept of individual responsibility and of personal freedom uh, is being called into question by such an approach. Uh, we, however, know that this is not uh, a problem that is exclusive to the Chinese, German companies, American companies uh, that invest in the United States, that employ people in the United States, uh, they will be working under the very same conditions. And thus we have to have an interest in what is happening here. But I'd, let me close by saying that the debate in China hasn't yet come to an end yet. It's still ongoing. We don't know uh, what will be the outcome, um, uh, the result of all all those um, tests and experiments that are being carried out in China right now. But the obvious question is on the table. Is there something like a minimum of morals for the digital age? Shouldn't we work to have something like that, like a common expression of the limits um, of the digital future in the decades or centuries to come, which brings me then to the question of whether we do not really need a much more intensive exchange of thoughts between the tech community, the political scientists, uh, about the philosophy of the individual than is happening at this point in time, at least as I see it. Well, if I, you know, if I were to choose, I would very much like to be in a position where I could leave Boskin today, um, having received the confirmation from all of you that I need not be afraid, that I need not be concerned, that the debate is taking place uh, in the very intensity that I would wish to see attributed to it, but whether that is the case or not, that we will have to hear and see from you. I very much look forward to this debate. <laughs> Thank you so much for setting the stage so beautifully. And I realized when, while you were start, uh, speaking that my uh, American colleagues didn't have translation, <laughs> ah, but you followed sorry. it uh, very nicely. And I very much appreciated the baseball reference. <laughs> I got that part. There were a couple of words in there I kind of got. Yes, but you, you really set the stage so well. Um, Great. <laughs> yes, that may be helpful for everyone. Great, time. thank you. <laughs> Should I repeat it? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Should, can you give us a, a bit of a summary? I heard Stanford. I heard right, that. Right. Yeah. And of course, you picked up on that, you know, which is exactly the segue to my question. Sure. So the president was um, was putting some sort of the, the societal change that we're going through where technologies of different sorts play such a vital role in the larger context of the future of democracy and um, the, the question of how do we want to live our lives and, and interact with each other and, and, and you know, shape our future. And uh, within that, he um, also referred to, as you picked up, uh, on a, a trip to Stanford um, and pointed out uh, already, and that's a theme I want to follow up on for a few minutes, sure. that there are tremendous opportunities, um, although currently the focus is really on the risks of new technologies, essentially in public discourse, for sure. Uh, particularly in Europe. But, but before we go into risk mode and, and talk about all the pitfalls of these new technologies, I, I would like to pause and really 
um, uh, zoom in a little bit on this question. Uh, what can technology do for climate change and other areas that the president mentioned? Against climate change. Against, <laughs> yes, against. Right, right, exactly. uh, to, to address some of the big, um, big challenges of our time. Sure. And uh, there is this other place closer to home, MIT, right. uh, where many of these technologies are, are developed in the lab. And I was wondering whether you would be willing to share maybe two, three examples from also your humanities perspective sure. that give you hope and optimism, maybe. Sure, I'm glad to do that. Good morning, everyone. Uh, well, you know, one of the things about MIT, I kind of hesitate in a certain way to be able to say two or three since the institute is kind of connected to uh, technological innovation. So I think I'd rather say a bit about what has made MIT uh, such a leader in thinking innovatively. And a big part of that has been the commitment to collaboration across all five schools. So it's a recognition that many of the problems that the world faces, obviously global in nature, and they require knowledge from all domains. That there is, it isn't just a scientific problem, it isn't just an engineering problem, it isn't just an economic problem or a social problem, it is all of these things together. And part of our strengths have been putting together research programs to deal with these. So we have, for example, the MIT uh, Energy Initiative, which brings get together uh, professors from engineering, science, uh, humanities, arts, and social sciences, the Sloan School to look at the economics and the business models of what is uh, sustainable and what not, um, as well as uh, architecture and planning to look at the ways in which climate change and, and the way we use energy is changing how we structure cities. So it is the, the scope of the problems and a commitment <laughs> to putting intellectual energies that are commensurate with them that I think uh, has set MIT in a better way for, for thinking about the future. So I hesitate to say any particular except to say that the problems are so massive, there is no way the technology cannot be a part of it. Right. And uh, the issue is how do we think creatively about technology to make sure that's happening? And that's a big part of what education has to do, to connect students to understand that the technology is an expression, is a human endeavor, right? We create the technology, technology doesn't create us. And we have to start with some basic commitments. So that's where we are um, um, now. And uh, I look forward to saying a bit more later on about the College of Computing. Fabulous, thank you so much, that's very helpful. Um, uh, some sort of an iteration on this theme and, and uh, you know, taking your point where you argue, well, there is no future without getting technology right in a way that helps us um, to address some of these big challenges we face uh, as a humanity, but also to embrace the opportunities. Um, I, was, I was wondering um, if, uh, whether you would be willing to share your thinking around this topic. Much of the ethical debates of these days are focused on um, uh, ethics in the sense of telling us what not to do, right? What lines not to cross. And we will definitely return uh, to that, and this will be the key part of the panel. But before, before we go there, uh, I was wondering, is there some sort of an ethical obligation uh, for the good use of technology? Um, and basically, uh, a moral imperative that um, would almost be in contrast to the precautionary principle that's so popular in Europe these days and say, no, we have to double down on developing technologies for the social good and in the public interest. How does a philosopher or ethicist uh, think about that? Yeah, um, thank you for that question. I'm happy to answer. So I think there are at least two ways to understand your question. First, we may ask um, if there is a moral obligation to generally use digital technology now that it has been invented and developed up to a point where so much um, concrete applications are possible. But um, my answer to this would be no. There's no general moral obligation to do what can be done. Because um, digitization is just a means, and uh, moral obligations refer to ends, to purposes, not to the way we get there. And so um, it is an open question if uh, digitization is the best way to get there where we want to go, uh, to our moral purpose, which is, as you already pointed out, a good, good democracy, human flourishing, and so on. And we have just to see exactly where digitization is helpful and where not. But on the other hand, if you ask if um, 
we uh, theorists, um, like theorists like us here as a, on, on the panel, should um, point out possible uh, positive uses of technology more often. I would say yes, and that's important too. <laughs> Because otherwise, the development of digital technology mostly is um, driven by interests for financial profit. And um, this is not the best premise um, for the best outcome in a moral perspective, from a moral perspective. So it would be surely good to have more people pointing out the positive um, uses. But I think um, there are already um, quite uh, examples for that, too, also where reflection and realization goes together. For example, at the Weizenbaum Institute, where I uh, was a fellow in summer at Berlin, um, a young colleague um, invented and developed an app which enables people from different um, parts of the political spectrum to um, chat and discuss it, it with each other online, for example. And um, yeah, I mean, there are a lot of um, opportunities and we should uh, point them out. But also, I want to add that um, also these projects always have to be chosen carefully because uh, um, yeah, you mentioned already with climate change, we can do good uh, things for, against climate change with digitization, but on the other hand, we also have to be aware of the fact that digitization, all the digital technologies themselves are consuming masses of energy. So um, it would be best to choose only those, those projects which have a really urgent reason there have to be something important at stake that we invent and, and apply new technologies. And I remember the British philosopher Derek Parfit saying that all people, all humans with um, healthy, with two healthy legs should use the stairs instead of the elevator in order to save energy. <laughs> because he said elevators are just made for people who cannot walk. And uh, a bit in the similar way, we should always watch, uh, watch out where are the urgent reasons that we um, invent um, digital technologies for. And um, what is urgent, what is important, always depends on the domain. It's, it's different in every domain. In medicine, for example, it's a diminishing, of, diminishing of suffering. In law, it's justice. In um, democracy, it's participation and uh, a well-founded formation of political opinion. And only then, when we have identified precise moral purposes, and we see that we cannot attain them but by digital technologies, then I think then we might be seen as obliged to use them. Wonderful. Great segue. You pointed out some sort of the big questions, uh, but also that these questions can only be answered or worked through in a particular application context. Yes. And you mentioned already a few. Mm -hmm. And uh, if I may, to, to get a little bit more specific and put like the conversation at from 30 or, you know, go from 30,000 feet a, a bit lower to 10,000 feet maybe and take two examples that illustrate some sort of the struggle, how we um, embrace opportunities, but also um, uh, protect against risks. And, and Matthew and, and Crystal, as I uh, already mentioned in the introduction, um, uh, you have interesting uh, work that, that some sort of serves as a case study in our context. Matthew, uh, focusing on health and public health and the role of technology, whether it's AI or IoT, how are some of these questions that Eva identified crystallizing and where do you see things going? What are some of the the concerns. What's the state of play? Yeah, so good morning, everybody. So um, uh, as uh, Professor Gazer has said, I'm a philosopher. And uh, I have a book coming out called The Ethics of Artificial Intelligence coming out next March. And we cover uh, a number of these uh, different issues in sort of the ethics of AI. And one of the applications of the ethics of AI is in the realm of healthcare. There are actually a lot of really exciting opportunities and a lot of development, uh, a lot of things being done in the area of healthcare. So for example, uh, machine learning is being deployed to sort of screen cancer cells. It's, it's found that it, it, it's almost as eff effective as radiologists. It's also being used in ophthalmology. Uh, it's been used to uh, screen, uh, uh, to figure out whether a embryo is going to be viable or not. Um, it's uh, natural language processing is being used to figure out whether uh, people are having suicidal thoughts. Uh, so 
So there are a lot of really uh, exciting developments that are uh, currently underway. Uh, and what that means for us is that um, it can really, for example, reduce uh, uh, sort of healthcare costs. In the US, I think we spend about three to four trillion dollars in healthcare each year. And um, so uh, one of the things that machine learning can do is reduce administrative costs in healthcare, for example. It can also uh, assist facilitating drug discovery. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, another example is uh, it can really realize the vision of precision uh, medicine. So for example, uh, Fitbits, uh, wearables, uh, to sort of figure out uh, healthy lifestyles, what you should be eating, uh, your uh, calorie intakes, and so on and so forth. So all those are really, really exciting developments. Uh, I'm an ethicist, so I also think about sort of some of the ethical problems, and I just want to very quickly share some of the ethical concerns uh, with you as well. So one of the biggest challenges with uh, machine learning is that it requires a lot of data. Uh, and so what that means is someone's got to go out there and collect all these data, and then you get into issues about privacy. Uh, especially in the healthcare, it's personal data that we're talking about. So, you know, one uh, obvious example is sort of Facebook and you know uh, Cambridge Analytica collecting a lot of information, f you know, using you know from Facebook users. Uh, another example is GlaxoSmithKline. Uh, they just recently bought uh, this company, 23andMe, which uh, is sort of uh, ancestry type. You, you upload your information, it gets your genetic information. So now they have all the database. Uh, and so one of the things we need to really be worried about is whether uh, you know is this are they collecting the data appropriately? Are they violating rights? What's what are the implications of the individuals? Another issue is going to be sort of the garbage in, garbage out problem. So you know the algorithms that we're using today uh, are going to only be as good as the data themselves. And so, but what we're, we're finding is that sometimes the data sets that we're collecting are not, uh, they, they don't have accurate representations of the subjects. So take, for example, uh, self-driving cars. It turns out that self-driving cars, uh, they're not so good at detecting uh, people of color because the training sets, uh, you know, the, 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 the training data that they use, they, they don't have enough uh, uh, of, uh, you know, sort of uh, people of color sort of in, in, in the data set. And so that's a problem when we deploy those uh, uh, sort of data, uh, sort of the algorithm in the wild. Um, and the, I'll just say one more thing. The biggest concern I have with machine learning right now is there's something called deep learning. And deep learning is actually a technical term. It just means that there's sort of, it's uh, using a big network uh, sort of to figure out, you know, um, you know what, you know how a machine should act, um, and um, and it's sort of powered a lot of the recent developments. Since uh, 2012, it's pow powered a lot of sort of the the, uh, the new breakthroughs. But one of the problems with deep learning is that it just doesn't capture the causality, the causal relations of. It doesn't really understand what it's doing, mm -hmm. um, and so it, it's uh, it's sort of it's 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 kind of it's linear regression. It's a lot of math, uh, but uh, here's one problem. Uh, so there's something called generative adversarial network. It's, it's a type of single, uh, so one type of attack is uh, something called the, uh, one, uh, a single pixel attack. So machine learning is very good at image classification. They can take images and they classify them very accurately. Uh, but uh, science uh, researchers have found that if you just take an image, uh, say an image of a car, and you just take one pixel and you change it from black to white, uh, the machine learning will completely screw it up. So for example, with the image of the car, Car, uh, uh, it'll now classify uh, that uh, that image as a dog uh, with 99% confidence. And just imagine deploying that type of machine learning in the context of healthcare, when sort of people's lives are at stake, or in the context of self-driving cars, right? Uh, and so we, uh, I think we're going to get into more of these discussions later. But I think that's where we have to be careful about rolling out these technologies. Crystal, does that sound familiar, listening to these stories from health uh, when you look at your work? 
on the use of algorithms and data in the criminal justice system, or where are differences? Yeah, I think there are a lot of similarities, and I think as some of the other panelists have pointed out, while algorithms are now basically used in so many parts of society, one of the areas where they've had a very dramatic increase in usage is the United States criminal justice system. And the algorithms here we often call risk assessment instruments, because what the algorithms are trying to do is predict somebody's future criminality. Uh, and these instruments now are used at various stages of the criminal justice system. Things from policing to pretrial and bail decisions to sentencing to probation and parole as well. And to just for uh, some examples, take predictive policing. One of the common technologies is called PredPol, which is used by the Los Angeles Police Department and over 60 other police departments across the United States, it uses historical data on crime types, where crimes have happened, to predict the future incidents of different criminal uh, incidents. In sentencing, now many states allow judges to consider risk scores that are meant to predict the future risk of committing new criminal behavior. Uh, one common algorithm here, which has been in the news a lot, you may have heard of, is the compass algorithm. It's a proprietary algorithm, so we actually don't know exactly the underlying algorithmic structure that classifies individuals on a scale of 1 to 10 in terms of their predicted likelihood of recidivism using how that person answers questions on a 137 question survey. So these are just some of the examples. And I think they raise a huge host of issues and challenges. One that I think requires a lot of understanding from philosophers and ethicists is do these risk assessment tools have a role to play even in the criminal justice system? I think some view the endeavor of predicting future risk as wrongheaded and believe that because of this input data, garbage in, garbage out type of problem, that using algorithms to predict future risk will only entrench or potentially exacerbate inequalities and inequities that we see in society at large. On the other hand, and I place myself more in this camp, while there is acknowledgment that the algorithms are often imperfect, I think it's also important to consider the relevant counterfactual. The counterfactual is not a world free of inequality of inequity. It's a counterfactual in which we have human decision makers. And and guess what? There's lots of evidence that human decision makers have a big role to play in perpetuating inequalities through bias and inconsistency. So there's a role, to, I think, to consider what are we comparing the algorithms to? It's not a perfect world. Uh, it's humans. I think another set of design questions that Matthew has gotten at um, is in the criminal justice system, there are lots of open, unresolved questions about how do we design an algorithm? If we're going to predict risk, can we consider individual characteristics like somebody's race or ethnicity, what we often call protected characteristics? If you can't, can you consider non-protected characteristics, things like education, where somebody lives, which can effectively proxy for a person's race or ethnicity? There's also complicated questions about how to evaluate if an algorithm is doing what we want it to do. What does it mean, for instance, for an algorithm to be fair. It turns out here the law has not so much to say so far about how to define or measure fairness. And even outside the law, there's a very lively computer science debate about algorithmic fairness, where there's very different definitions of fairness that in many circumstances we could all say that one sounds great or that one sounds great. But it's actually been shown mathematically that in many instances it is impossible to simultaneously satisfy all those notions of algorithm fairness. And so then that requires a normative choice by us as a society or a legal system to choose which of those definitions of algorithmic fairness um, should dominate. So I think those are just a couple of the key issues and challenges that I see in the criminal justice system. No shortage of challenges. No shortage, <laughs> absolutely. It's clear from both stories. <laughs> I'd love to, to um, build up on this and, and ask Wolfgang Crystal made the point that part of it is a story about technology, but part of it also seems to be a story about society at large, about the institutions we already have in place, um, 
part of it seems to be about human nature with our own biases. So how do you think about that as we have these intense debate about, debates about AI uh, decision making and, and versus human decision making and you know, should we replace judges by AIs or not? Uh, how much is it about technology really? Um, I think to, to respond to that, I have to go to flight level uh, 10,000 again, <laughs> I would say, uh, but I'm, I'm descending later. <laughs> um, the, um, Only in a good way. Don't in, in a good way, yes, uh, I hope. Um, so uh, when we talk about technology in, in expert circles, uh, but at, at society at large, then uh, we very often have a distinction between here is the society, here is the technology. And that is a dangerous thing, because then we frame technology as a kind of, of natural disaster that is coming and we have to build walls to, to cope with that. Mm -hmm. And we are not in the mode of, um, of uh, creating the technology as a society and together with the different disciplines. So I think we have to be very careful how we talk about these things and where we um, talk about tensions. And um, I can, I think, uh, build on what Crystal said because uh, we are doing some research in the criminal justice system um, as well uh, and have done recently. And um, what I find interesting is that when we talk about technology coming into uh, processes, then we start thinking about what our quality measures are as a society here. And I had a, a discussion with German judges a couple of months ago, and we are talking about sentencing, and um, we are talking about AI uh, supporting that, and then I raised the question of explainability, which is one of the issues in, in AI that we say we cannot really see uh, and explain what happens there. And then one of the judges uh, said, wait a moment, ask me, can I explain what I'm doing when I come to this decision? And I'm not sure that I really can do that. I can uh, give a reason that is uh, valid in the legal system, but I cannot really explain what, what, what my motives were here. And then we had a debate on what are the factors there. And in German legal uh, system and the criminal law, it's not very well elaborated what the criteria are. So it's very, very uh, vague, and so we had a very fruitful debate on what the values actually are. And you can have the same in other fields of, of society. We have uh, um, uh, next week, or the week after, a, a workshop with um, computer scientists and uh, uh, people from, from communication science and law talking about how to um, um, uh, understand uh, diversity um, in recommender systems for the media. Um, and we want to come up with um, ideas what that actually is. And then you have to go back and what do you want as a society actually uh, when you talk about uh, diversity. So I think that's a good thing that uh, technology forces us to ask these hard questions about uh, um, uh, societal values um, and to better understand what makes human decision making so special. We are talking a lot about things like tested knowledge and tested norms, things that uh, we all understand because we are part of the society and we cannot really explain why we do that this way or that way because it's kind of tested knowledge or tested, tested norms and that is something that you cannot really now I would say built into technology that would require technology to be part of society and learn in interaction and I think we are far from, from that so far. So um, I, I, I believe that uh, this is a twist of, of uh, the debate that uh, very often we, we do not really include in our conversation when we, we talk about this uh, society here, technology there aspect. Jeanette, if Wolfgang is right and he's most often right, and, uh, tech, as we know, um, and, and technology is deeply embedded in society. And uh, as we heard the president opening, in his opening remarks, we as societies are in a, in a learning process ourselves, how to cope with massive challenges and, and, and transformations of all sorts. Um, based on the work you've been doing following early debates around internet regulation and uh, approaches to governance, What's currently happening in this societal learning process as we try to identify and agree and you know, regulate good users versus bad users across different contexts? And we only highlighted two examples and could man add many more. What, what sorts of norms are emerging? And what's some sort of the, the, the dynamics around these norms as you observe it? 
thank you, Urs. I could talk for hours on this question. <laughs> I really like it. Let me step uh, one. Uh, let me go one step back. At the time when the internet and digital technologies switch off the mic, sorry, uh, on the oh, mic, on, no, on the on the uh, am Gerät on the side. Have you have you this Gerät? It's in here. It's in here. Yeah. Okay. Around the time, well, it's better. <laughs> digital technologies really became uh, more present in our societies. Western societies went through a long period of privatization and liberation from old state monopolies, and we thought of uh, the the, uh, the force of the internet as a form of liberal liberalization, and that kind of uh, idea of self-regulation and let the markets determine the future, we thought that this was a very good alternative. And this we have sort of um, driven to a point where we now regard digital technologies only as a, uh, nearly as a self-driving autonomous force. We ascribe a lot of power and agency to digital technologies themselves and the companies who develop them. I would say that the debate we see now about AI and ethical frameworks is sort of an echo of that. The idea that ethical principles might be good enough to give us an orientation for the future of artificial intelligence. But we need to ask ourselves um, whether we get enough accountability out of ethical guidelines and frameworks. I just came back from the West Coast where you see a, really a change of wind. Uh, companies now begin to wonder whether they do not need a legal framework for the future development. Um, such a legal framework could be, for example, anchored in human rights, and legislation could build on fundamental rights. They could sort of set limits to future um, developments, also to make us see that finally it is society that shapes technology. It's not that technology sets its own rules. But we are not really aware of it. I think at the moment we nearly have lost the capability to see and to recognize how we change technologies as societies. So we need to sort of perhaps uh, turn around a bit, give up this idea of complete self-regulation and come to new, new models that sim sit somewhere in between a market approach and a pure government approach. We need new regulatory frameworks that need to work across national boundaries, even though um, we can, I think, not hope for multilateral approaches. We need something below, and the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation that the European Commission introduced, is often mentioned as a gold standard for that kind of approach. Perhaps some countries can get together, build a legal framework, and export it via trade agreements. There's some good advice. Thank you, Jeanette. So, um, a couple of things that I would like to, to follow up on. One is this role of the ethics principles. You mentioned there is a flourishing of ethical principles yeah. around AI in particular. I think 130 or something uh, are out there. Um, we tried to map some of them, but uh, it's getting quite the task. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, on the other hand side, uh, given also Wolfgang's remarks and, and the opening statement by, by uh, Herrn Bundespräsident, uh, there is value to these ethical debates, um, nonetheless, right? Yeah. And, and you also make this point, of course, that we need all different approaches and tools, probably, uh, including law, but also ethics. And, and if, if I may ask you, um, how do you think about these ethical principles? What, what's some sort of the value when these ethical norms crystallize in guidelines and things like that, whether it's for companies or enacted by international organizations like OECD or even by nation states? Um, what's the promise, but also what are the limitations of ethical approaches of this sort when we deal with these complex, messy problems? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... Ethics and law, of course, have to be distinguished, although they are connected. Ethics is, I would say, 
the explicit formulation of implicit norms that guide or should guide our, ethical, our everyday actions in uh, our life are living together. And law, it's um, the core of, an, of the organization of a state or a nation, transforms some of these norms into concrete rules, the infringement of which then is bound up with sanctions by the state. So and this is something um, different. And not all moral norms are uh, legal norms and vice versa, of course. But um, ethical guidelines now for new topics like digitization can be, I think, helpful first steps to show something that then can be transformed into law, too. Speaking of law, what's your hope that, looking at your area of research, that the law will some sort of evolve in this dynamic situation where maybe ethical principles may lead the way? Where do you see the promise of law in these debates where you know we're facing this shift from the human towards the machine? Yeah, I think law has a very important role to play here. I think I share Jeanette's sort of general sense that self-regulation is probably not going to be a sufficient solution, and that there have to be legal interventions. Um, and the law is both instrumental in that it will undoubtedly, by deciding what to permit and what to prohibit, shape the behavior of governments, private companies, in terms of how they design algorithms, how they implement them on the ground. The law, I think, also has important expressive principles maybe related to ethics where if the law allows for something, then citizens, members of society, will view something as maybe more socially acceptable. So I think the law here has a big role to play. Um, coming back to the criminal justice system, though, I think there are many ways in which the current law, certainly in the United States, falls short a lot of for a lot of the new challenges that might come with algorithms. So to give you some examples, uh, many people are troubled by the use of disparities that can emerge when you use an algorithm to make decisions. And that could be because of the data or the structure of the algorithm. Now, it turns out there's probably pretty limited legal remedies for addressing those disparities. Um, under current US law, a finding of discrimination under the Equal Protection Clause of the US Constitution Constitution would require a showing of discriminatory intent or purpose. And that's hard because when an algorithmic designer chooses to use a variable or certain types of data, there's probably often no discriminatory intent or purpose. And yet, because so many variables can be proxies for things we're troubled by, there's often maybe no direct legal remedy. And so this traditional requirement we've had in the US Constitution and case law of requiring intent and motive is often ill-suited to addressing the new types of problems that the algorithms can introduce. Introduce. Moreover, it's actually been the case in the US that many have interpreted the case law on discrimination as requiring or prohibiting the use of characteristics like race or ethnicity. You cannot use them in any way, shape, or form. But the reality is that because of the complex statistical relationships underlying many variables, I, other computer science uh, scientists, economists have written and shown that those proxy effects that we may be worried about are often created because of the prohibition on the use of those characteristics. And that once you take statistics into account, you may actually want to use protected characteristics in certain forms to actually remedy those disparities. And so it's actually this problem right now where I think the law is pushing companies, governments, to develop versions of algorithms that may actually be counterproductive to our larger societal goal of equality and opportunity. And I think, you know, to the earlier point about human decision making, the law often does not consider counterfactuals in a very easy way. It often seems to require perfection for algorithms, explainability. But as you point out, what is more black box than what is in a judge's mind? Perhaps the judge's mind mind is more of a black box than a neural network or other True. forms of machine learning. And so I worry that the law, by sometimes requiring perfection and not considering the counterfactual, will often chill and deter what may be innovative and good uses of, of algorithmic decision making. So also the relationship between technology and law and law and ethics is very complicated and very bidirectional mm -hmm. with unintended consequences included. Still, if I may, um, some 
of you have um, put this on the same, on a par in a way, that does not convince me of any decision taken by an algorithm being plausible. You know, the fact that we don't always understand algorithms and uh, software that is uh, guided and steered by algorithms. And that leaves me very concerned. We say that the situation in America is slightly different from the situation in Germany. So, you know, judge passes a sentence or a judgment, you ha, he or she has to justify that decision. Not every ruling or decision has to be accepted. People may have a different opinion, but as a rule, as far as the tradition in Germany is concerned, you do have a very extensive duty to justify your a sentence or your ruling. And that is what lacks when you talk about algorithms. That is one of the questions that we need to discuss, I believe. Is it conceivable at all algorithmen that algorithms, algorithmen that the control of algorithms can become or be made more transparent, of course, not towards each and every individual person, but perhaps with regard to those who uh, consider themselves the representative of the government, you know, the body in question responsible for protecting the rights and the freedoms of the individual. Can you hear me? And a second remark that I'd like to make against the backdrop of what has just been said, it is good that we have a debate up here on the rostrum, so to speak, about the ethical principles for digital transformation. But what struck me, and I've tried to refer to that in my introductory remarks, when I um, bring together a group of experts in my uh, office. I have experts briefing me about the technological potential of AI. Uh, you know, I have an idea after these talks of what is doable, what is conceivable, but when I have talks about the ethical limits of digitization, brings together a wholly different group of people, because as a rule, um, I do not meet IT experts or engineers, but I meet social scientists, philosophers, political scientists, which is an ident uh, uh, indication to some extent of something that keeps me deeply troubled, and that is that we have a debate, but that that debate takes place within closed circles, closed communities. That is to say, we have a debate about the ethical limits of uh, a digital age, and that we have to bear in mind with limits that we should not surpass or overstep. We have a similar debate about the functioning of democracy, um, but it is not carried beyond the respective communities. Please tell me if I'm wrong. I'm happy to hear you point that out to me. But um, as I see it, and I, as I would wish to see it, the two communities that I've been mentioning, the tech community on the one hand, and the more philosophical community bringing together social scientists and philosophers, we don't have a discussion that brings both groups together. We haven't been able to link up that discussion. Is that impression that I have correct? Would you agree with that? Is it limited to Germany? Um, or would you say that this is also transferable to the debate in uh, the United States? Change that right over at MIT. Can you, can you share your thoughts? And then I would like to open up for a number of questions. Um, so be sure. ready with your questions. So the Schwarzman, the College of Computing, which is, was announced last year, is intended to get it just this issue that uh, much of the technologies that are obviously being created at MIT, uh, uh, we recognize that there has to be a bridge between technology and the humanities, arts, and social sciences in an intentional, deliberate way. And part of the why the school was established is tons of students are interested in computing. They're doing it. They're coming in wanting to major in computer science. But many of them don't want to only be computer scientists. They want to apply that knowledge to something else. But they want it to be guided by some domain knowledge outside of computer science. Uh, and so the goal of the college is to eventually, we beginning to see joint blended degrees between computer science and economics, computer science and urban studies, computer science and music. Uh, not all students are doing this, but the interest is great. And it's intended to allow for this connection in a more organic way from the beginning. 
such that students will have the type of skills so that we won't be talking about disparate communities, but that students will have enough of an openness, at least an, uh, an exposure to understanding that this is, an, this is what it means to be a computer scientist. And conversely, from my own d discipline, I'm a political scientist, this is what, this is what it means to be a, co a political scientist, is to know something about this. So all of us are going to have to learn more and be open to learning more um, if, if, we're, if we're going to successfully deal, deal with this uh, issue. I think one other thing I like to say about it is, is you know, we're starting to have these conversations on campus. They are not easy conversations to have. As much as we try to be collaborative, we've, have to, we've really had to uh, work. Uh, we, we may be using the ser same terms, but we speak a different language. <laughs> and it requires patience to do this. So part of what we're doing is also learning some other principles of generosity and patience <laughs> as we deal with one another. Because if we want to solve this, this problem, deal with technology in the way that we all want to see, um, then that's what it's going to require. Some other human qualities that we have to bring to bear for this to happen. And um, I think it's especially, just uh, in conclusion, it's really important for us, for our, our undergraduates, since many of them, will be going into leadership positions. They know the technologies. We need them working on the congressional staff. If you all saw the hearings with, with Mark Zuckerberg and the Congress people didn't know what Google was, right? Or they didn't know the difference between Samsung and Apple. I mean, they didn't know anything about the technologies. If they don't understand how to open the phones, how can you imagine that they can be responsible and entrusted to do the kinds of things that you all are describing? Some of what we also need are our, uh, you know, our students to be able to play those kind of roles, um, um, precisely because, but they, we, won't, we don't want them to do it only knowing the technology. They also have to understand economics, also have to understand political science and such. So that is the, the task of the college, and um, we're just getting started, so stay tuned. It's exciting, it's exciting, thank you. Okay, let's open up for a few questions. Uh, Becca, our mic runner, is ready and fast on her legs. Who has a question? And um, please end with a question mark. That would be great. <laughs> <laughs> Me? Um, first, thank you so much for all the interesting insights you shared today. Um, my question is regarding the fact that a lot of you mentioned today that there's sort of an urgency to craft tech-specific ethics regulations as soon as possible. So in a way, this is really a moral discussion with a deadline. When would you say is this deadline? When do we have to sort of formulize our thoughts and put it into law? Oh, uh, what was the question for me? Oh, you, <laughs> now it is, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. But no, um, of course, I think the deadline is, uh, um, it's, not, it's not far ahead, but it's just uh, right now. But um, there are already a lot of ethic guidelines being written right now. So we have on national levels, I know a different one in Germany, then there are international levels, like, the, um, for example, the high-level export group, um, um, that um, got the um, task by the um, European Commission and they wrote something and then we have already uh, part of this uh, ethic guidelines for example extracted and the G20 um, group uh, signed it and so um, there are already guidelines but, but I think the guidelines are only the first uh, step and then um, of course they are first step um, to transform them into law as we heard already with the Datenschutzgrundverordnung and um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's right now, and, and we should um, go further ahead, but it's still it's already something happening, I think. Wolfgang? Yeah, maybe I can add a, a legal perspective to that, because it's uh, one of the problems of the law is that the function of law is uh, to have stability. <laughs> and uh, what we need here is some flexibility as well. And so what we are struggling with as legal scholars is to find ways to make law more uh, flexible, to have constant evaluation, to have sunset clauses and things like that, so that we do not have to wait. Uh, I think it was Susan Crawford said the marvelous sentence, we have to uh, regulate things that we don't understand. And I think we are, we can't wait 
until we have all, all the lawmakers have understood what what actually is. We have to do. Do we have to act before? But then we need different instruments, uh, especially when you take into account that that what you said that when you are talking with lawmakers, even if they really try hard, the problems are really high tech. Only a couple of people really understands what's happening there, and you you cannot uh, even the best uh, member of parliament cannot be an expert in this field. So um, uh, we need a, a constant evaluation and some mechanisms uh, to deal with that, that we, we every day, um, uh, even we as researchers, every week I have a new understanding of uh, uh, how algorithms interact with society. I have a meeting, I have uh, interaction with some software engineers, and now, ah, okay, it's a little bit different than I thought before. And um, on this basis, to create law, that's, a, I would say, a fundamentally new challenge. But if I, if I may add to what you've just said, the situation is changing. When you take a look at the German legal culture, you know, it always bases, is based on the assumption that a law that is passed is until kingdom come, it's for eternity, you know. Uh, when we now look at the area of internet law, something interesting is happening that uh, is quite difficult, quite complicated when you look to the relationship between uh, the one passing the law, making the law, and the public, you know, um, public comments about uh, the Network Enforcement Act in Germany, for example, uh, is an indication of that. In some areas of legislation, we have already reached a point where we can no longer provide uh, a uh, eternal guarantee for the legislation that is being passed. We are taking one step, hesitatingly after the other, carefully trying out to see how that intervention is going to affect the reality in the future. This careful and cautious tentative approach in legislation that is uh, uh, taking place right now is not something that is being greeted with enthusiasm, and I do understand, but there might be no alternative to that approach, you know, trying to time and again refer back from the instruments to the technology and vice versa and to amend things when well necessary. Such an amazing group of people is, you know, we could discuss 20 <laughs> minutes, just <laughs> one question. So you want to jump in quickly with comments, yeah. uh, Jeanette? And no, then no. Um, <laughs> I thought perhaps one way forward could be to uh, pursue a more uh, pro uh, procedural approach to these problems. For example, think of ways to holding companies accountable to the kind of technology development they try to bring to the market, introducing auditing uh, requirements for certain types type of algorithms, make it mandatory to only use in certain areas um, machine learning systems that are self-explainable, that sort of uh, explain in at least basic ways uh, how they come to certain recommendations and predictions. That seems to be a way forward rather than uh, relying pr uh, just on rules. Mm -hmm. So maybe I can also jump in here. So uh, I think uh, <laughs> Professor Gaiser mentioned that there are about 130, okay, uh, 130 uh, ethical <laughs> principles that are being sort of uh, uh, presented by different companies and so on and so forth. I think what we really we also need is sort of a kind of rationale, a philosophical justification, this is a plug for philosophers, uh, you know, uh, a philosophical justification for some of these principles. So for example, they talk about, you know, a lot of these principles say things like, we need explainability. Why do we need explainability? I mean, we, we, we've heard some of the panelists asking this question. And or sort of, uh, uh, and, and various other things. And so here in that line, I'm very sympathetic to what Professor Hoffman's saying, which is this idea of the human rights framework, which sort of says that, you know, uh, you know we need to look towards the goal. What, what are these algorithms for? Fundamentally, um, they're about promoting human well-being. Right? We want to make sure that we have a harmonious society, one that sort of works towards all of us. And so a human rights framework, I, I think, can really uh, there's, uh, uh, move towards that goal. And there's a rich tradition, there's a rich literature on these philosophical justif justifications of the different rights. And they sort of go beyond just discrimination. Right? They sort of say they're positive rights. They're rights where, uh, uh, you know, where we just, it's not just about making sure that you don't discriminate, but making sure that you technologies also work to help uh, people and so on and so forth. And the other thing about human rights is that it's sort of, it's an obligation on everybody. 
So it's not just an obligation on the engineers. It's not just an obligation on the company. It's not just an obligation on the government. It's an obligation on all of us. We need to collectively make sure that we're working to, you know, uh, towards make, uh, uh, making sure that these technologies uh, work well for everybody. I promise to be very brief. I know there are a lot of uh, the hands up. This is such a fascinating question. Yeah. I think I wholeheartedly endorse the perspectives others have raised, especially Mr. President, that the laws must be adaptive. They must be flexible because we are still learning how they work, how the algorithms uh, work. And so we have to also study when a new regulation goes into effect. What does that mean about the types of algorithms we're seeing that flourish after that? What types of algorithms are now disappearing as a result? Um, to the point about explainability, I I think we all have this you know, desire to understand what the algorithm is doing. And so we often then might shift towards regulation or some principles that the algorithm be explainable. The complication there is now there's emerging work coming from computer science and economics showing that when you force an algorithm to be explainable, you generally will choose an algorithm that's simpler because it has to be easier to understand. But a simpler algorithm, as it turns out in some contexts, actually can lead to both less efficient results results and less equitable results, which again raises a conundrum that I think no field alone can address, but just reveals that there are inherent trade-offs every time we make a choice like explainability. And we have to confront those trade-offs and decide how do we weigh competing values, which are inevitably going to be at stake. Great. So let's collect three <laughs> questions and then we respond. One question here and then maybe one from over here. This area. Yeah, yep. I'd like to add an observation. Um, I think it's also observable in the, on the podium that we are missing economists and we are missing behavioral scientists. And it seems to me that these two components are crucial in understanding the impact that AI has had and will have on our society and each of us. Why do I say this? Because AI has enormous economic potency. In this country, it's the majority of the productivity of this country comes from AI. And why is it that Facebook and Google and other companies have been doing you know, undaunted what they have been doing is because exactly of that. And so that is one reality that we have to face. And this reality is deeply immersed in research as well. Where is most of our funding going? It is going to computer science, to computer engineering, and then we have some alibi, excuse the term, addition of social sciences and, if we are lucky, behavioral sciences. There's Thank you, no... Sorry, we have to stop there's there. no... It's just, it's very... Well, we've heard a lot from the panel. So, it's... it's uh, so it, I'm sorry. But, you know, there is no level playing field between the behavioral sciences and all the psychological dynamics that are opened up by AI and computer scientists and computer engineering. Unless we change these funding structures, we've heard a lot about the necessity for other regulations for companies, but these funding structures have enormous consequences. President Steinmeier was asking, is there any example about, you know, at the beginning of such an enterprise to bring disciplines together? I would say yes, and actually at the Ruhr Universität Bochum, there's one company Competence cluster that focuses on cybersecurity, which tries to give level headed equal importance to social behavioral science on the one economics and uh, computer science and computer engineering. So I just hope that in the future such discussions move beyond very important contributions from philosophers, ethicists, and, and, and lawyers to also, you know, have a brighter view. Back up. <laughs> we collect, yeah, please. Go ahead, please. Uh, I'll keep myself short. Yep. Um, as we are at the German American Conference right now, I just wanted to ask how does um, transatlantic relationship help us in solving all these challenges? What is needed for an effective transatlantic relationship, especially the German American one, uh, to solve all these challenges together as like a world and not as like separate states? Okay. Maybe one or two more. Yes, please. I have a question. <laughs> I appreciate that. Do you think, talking about social media, that the time will come that there will be a reliable algorithm to identify 
hate speech. Okay. So Over there. And I, and I, I question promise to short Hi. question. Um, I'm one of those computer scientists writing those messy algorithms. And I know that there are people in my field who think very critical about this. And I know there's a lot of discussion. So I can kind of convince you there are people behind the curtain talking about the things. How can we reach out to like other people who are thinking about this? So my question is short. Um, thank you all. This is, was delightful. Um, I would like to understand, are we being human race empowered by technology, or are we powering technology by humans? Great. All right. Uh, we have 12 minutes left. Uh, and I'm Swiss, as I said, so I want to end on time. Uh, so what I would suggest is that we actually do a closing round um, and pick the question that you would like to address, but put it into the context also of your work and what we've discussed here. Uh, so we have the question of transatlantic relationships. We have the question around social, me uh, social media and um, the role of technology in creating a safer environment, um, using the example of hate speech. And we have this ultimate question is technology empowering people or are people here somehow to empower technology? So these are a few of, of the themes. Um, perhaps we start uh, with Eva. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, maybe to, to the um, yeah, two last questions. Uh, of course, I think that um, the technology should empower people, but for that uh, human machine interaction, it is important that we understand each other as we already talked about and maybe I just hint to two aspect that um, philosophy can um, contribute here. And the one is, um, it's not about only about explainability that you said, and it's not only what is also important about the ethic or moral um, justification of why it is so important to explain, but also to see that in morality, for example, it's about reason giving. So um, the whole moral valid, the validity of moral norms depends, I think, on the fact that they exist between being beings that can give reasons and understand reasons. And so one question would be, um, do we want uh, algorithms as judges who cannot give reasons in an emphatic sense, for example? And another topic would be um, the topic of trust, because the ethic guidelines often <coughs> highlight trustworthy AI as a claim. And I would also be skeptical if this is a best um, aim because um, trustworthiness presupposes also being a moral subject because you um, uh, because trust means to some to believe that someone will hold to his or her commitment to do something and this is also something that is only possible for moral subjects so AA systems cannot be trustworthy uh, agents or uh, subjects. Thank you. Matthew? Yeah, so I'll take the question on hate speech. Uh, so, I mean, there's some attempts to, uh, you know, using uh, machine learning algorithms to sort of detect things like fake news and things like that. But I actually want to give you a, a very grim picture. This is like election 2.0, since we're sort of coming up to another election cycle. So there's some evidence, there's something called deep fake, which is, uh, you know, being able to produce all these videos that, uh, kind of just look like you know they can kind of superimpose your photo or you onto another video and then they can get you to sort of talk and do various things and what people are finding is that um, so there's the theory that you tend to vote for people who look like you okay and so now the um, the, the def they're creating deep fake videos where they kind of superimpose a candidate's picture onto your pic uh, your picture onto a candidate's picture so it looks like you and now uh, supposedly that's going to influence your voting behavior because you're more likely to vote for people who look like you and so that's going to be very worrying uh, in the future and so that's some uh, and and then the question is uh, we're going to get to a point where it's going to be very hard for human eyes to be able to detect those differences, and that's going to be very worrying. Jeanette. I'd also like to pick up uh, the question on hate speech. Um, what I uh, find really good about this question is because we have so many examples that show how deeply ambiguous we are about such, um, such wording. Um, 
uh, Facebook once told me the example of the term bitch. Bitch can be really dismissive when you call a woman a bitch, but nowadays in some circles, bitch can also be appreciative. Women might refer to each other as bitches. How is, how is Facebook supposed to regulate? Uh, I mean, how is Facebook supposed to regulate <laughs> wordings that have so different meanings? And that, I think, shows also the limit the limit of uh, 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 technical filtering of language. Language is changing all the time, and it differs ac across cultures also very much. So there are really limits. Another point, I, if I may, um, the question of empowering uh, versus disempowering. Um, I really like this question because it implicitly refers to autonomy of human beings. I think it's a mistake to think autonomy needs to be defended against technology. Technology in many ways enhances our autonomy. Think of flying around, think of your watch. I mean, we coordinate as societies through these technologies and at the same time they are disciplining ourselves. So it's not an either or and technology and human beings are not opposites. It's the matter of how we structure and shape the relationship between the two. Dean Nobles, uh, is it okay if we go last with you, Mr. President? Yeah. Dean Nobles. Sure, I'll just uh, take the question of the computer scientists who said these kind of conversations are also, ha also happening among computer scientists, uh, but, uh, uh, but we need to get more better connection with others who are thinking critically about it. Um, I think that um, obviously education plays a hugely important role in this, right? That is, early on getting students of different disciplines to work together and, and to learn together in a way that addresses these questions um, exactly. The challenge of all knowledge is making sure that it doesn't stay siloed and that we work in a truly uh, um, collaborative way. And uh, it seems to me that's the challenge for the 21st century. Yeah, I think if I, I pick the, the comment, if I may, on the, uh, on the funding and, and interdisciplinary research. I think we talk a lot about interdisciplinary research and we need it to solve problems, but the academic system is not really designed to cater that need. Um, we still have problems with that, and I constantly get phone calls from colleagues uh, that want to apply for, for a project funding next week, and they said, oh, we have just seen we need some ethics in it, and uh, <laughs> we need a lawyer or something like that, would you be available? And uh, uh, normally I say, now no, because it has to be part of the project question and not just an icing on the cake that has already been baked. It's, it's, uh, um, that makes no sense. And so I think we have issues here in the academic uh, system. And maybe uh, 30 seconds on the transatlantic issue, I think it's, it's uh, uh, really helpful and, and uh, good for this question that there are really stable research relationships between our American colleagues and, and the research in Germany. It's, it's uh, uh, really great and that survives even if there is a political winter or autumn uh, uh, that we have this relationship and to solve these kind of problems I think that's extremely helpful. Yeah, I'll just follow up also on the, the research question, the excellent question over here. I failed to mention I am actually an economist as well as a lawyer, and I would welcome uh, many more economists studying this area, and I hope that the funding structures as well as the incentives do promote that greater collaboration. Um, I think the computer science community is doing amazing work. It's often siloed from what the economics community is thinking about, what the legal community is thinking about, and so I think initiatives like what Dean Nobles is doing is probably a really great way way of bringing people together. And to education, there is such a need for infusing this type of learning in legal systems. Um, and I don't think that US law schools, at least, have really been at the forefront of this. In fact, many of the decisions you read from state Supreme Court judges who are ruling on the use of algorithms and making important case law have explicit acknowledgments. I'm paraphrasing here, but I'm not paraphrasing so far of the judges in this case were limited in their decision making because they didn't understand how the algorithm worked. Well, that's a really big problem. And so we need to train the lawyers who will be deciding these cases, working on behalf of clients who are both creators of algorithms and individuals adversely affected by algorithms to understand how algorithms work. Herr Bundespräsident, Sie haben das Schlusswort. 
Mr. President, you have the final word. Yeah, herzlichen Dank. Ich versuche thank you, jetzt nicht thank you indeed. I'm not attempting uh, even, attempting to respond to all the questions that were put to us, but allow me to begin by the following remark. The debate that we have just been witnessing with the participation of the audience would undoubtedly be easier in the future if we were to keep it clear from any misunderstandings. If I may come back to the question that you put at the beginning, why uh, is there no economy? Economist amongst uh, the people here, you know the economic potential of IT and artificial intelligence is being seen sufficiently, I believe. So if you take a look at uh, the expert, the group of experts brought together here, you will undoubtedly find confirmed that everyone here is aware of the economic potential, everyone is aware of the technological potential, everyone is aware of the potential that exists when it comes to fighting poverty, uh, fighting disease. Disease, uh, im Kampf uh, gegen die Veränderungen des Weltklimas fighting the impact of climate change. If we want to be successful in those areas, we need experts uh, at uh, the top level. And we in Germany intend to participate in that development das just as much as you do. Um, but um, that is a kind of advance uh, remark. Ja nicht, um, I want Zeitalter to be very clear, having said what I've said, doesn't mean that we end up in an age of unbridled regulation, denen wir das Spannungs uh, crazy approach towards a craze about regulation. When you look at the field of tension between new technologies and AI on the one hand, and what is the constituent element of our societies, and that is democratic decision-making processes in Western societies. There is a field of tension. Shouldn't we make that also a topic of the discussion every once in a while? And that is why I suggested to make that the topic of our discussion today. So no one should assume or be I'm afraid that this uh, inherently entails a secret in wish to, uh, in some in way, influence the development uh, uh, or to slow down the developments in the field of AI and, and uh, technologies of digitization. But that's not my intention, really. But there is this field of tension I mentioned, and we have to focus on it. We have to deal with it. And this is equally true for all those who participate in the process of technological development of these uh, means of communication. This should not be left to philosophers or individual group sectors. It has to be viewed as a topic for all of us. And if we uh, pursue such an approach, we will, I believe, reach a point, and that has become obvious here as a consequence of the discussion, where we don't leave it to appealing to the morals and each of every individual and his or her responsibility. Um, but we need to have a debate across borders whether there should be limits to technological process that we should not surpass, because this, at the end of the day, is what it is all about. It's difficult enough when you look at Germany and the United States of America, but it will become even more difficult when you think about those countries that um, have a completely different uh, social system. Uh, uh, approach. But we need to have that debate. We need to have it with a country like China. And in saying that, I'm not cherishing any illusion about us having in 10 or 5 years a kind of UN charter uh, on artificial intelligence. We won't get that. Uh, but nevertheless, we should engage in that kind of a debate. Uh, just as much as we uh, have a debate with China, although we have different views on the issues of bioethics and genetic engineering. Um, we are not in agreement on these issues, but nevertheless, we have succeeded in uh, defining some limits or ceilings or restrictions. Thus, I am not discouraged, you know, in any way when I look to the possibility of such a debate, although it's going to be a complicated one. But, um, you know, this was mentioned, uh, what we need is, a transatlantic debate on this subject matter too.
Apart from all the topics of the day, the conflicts of the day, and I don't want to downplay their importance, but we have to tackle the question of the importance of the freedom of the individual, of the democratic culture in the states of the Western world, and we count ourselves amongst those, uh, just as well as the United States of America. And we need to have that debate amongst the Western world first and foremost. This is why I would wish to ask to have the opportunity time again, as I have been trying to see it during my visit here to engage in discussions and debates that do not solely um, focus on the present conflicts, uh, trade conflicts being just one case in point, but to have a transatlantic dialogue about the issues that are really at the essence of what links us and affects us in the years to come and will be affecting us in the future too. Uh, I very much look forward to my next visit to Boston and to Harvard, and thank you for having come here.